I actually will just start. Um, maybe one question for Sonia. So um, you mentioned this 23andMe genetic testing. So you have a 25-year-old who is looking for God knows what, but they have a VAL122 ILE variant, and they show up in your office, um, no symptoms. So what are you telling them? Yeah, that's a great question, and I've actually run into this somewhat recently. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, essentially the first thing is I ask them what research they've done on their own, because it's really helpful to have an understanding of where they're coming from and, you know, what their impressions of are, what they've read online, or maybe what they've even read from their own genetic test report. But um, the, the first thing I tell them is that variant in particular, this is probably a true positive. So I, I kind of treat the session as if, you know, we've already got a positive result, but that there is some chance that maybe it's not. So we do proceed with uh, clinical confirmatory testing, as I had mentioned before. Um, but we, we are talking about, you know, that, that increased risk for the cardiac amyloidosis. Um, in particular, we talk a little bit about amyloidosis in general, um, implications for family members. You know, like I said, really kind of treating it like a positive test report um, at that point. Um, but that we'll have further discussion once the clinical results come back. And, and usually at that point, it's a phone call to confirm um, that, that the results did come back positive. Um, and at that point, I also talk about our awesome uh, multidisciplinary clinic and, and the providers that we have here. I know we just heard from Dr. Rosenthal um, and Dr. Goodman, and, and they are really great. And so I talk about the support that we have um, on our team and that they're there is support from other clinical standpoints um, and, and the genetic implications of that as well, just in terms of what are we thinking about for family planning and, and other family members, because this oftentimes is a surprise. You know, they many times don't even know that this is something in the family or had never heard of this before. Um, so there's a lot that we, <laughs> that we cover in one of those genetic counseling sessions, but um, it, it is something that comes up and, you know, I, Whenever patients ask me about 23andMe testing or direct-to-consumer testing in general, should they do it, should they not, really it's a personal decision and it's up to them, but I tell them, you know, there are things that we might find out about that you're not expecting to find out about, so certainly worth doing your research ahead of time um, and considering both what it might mean for yourself as well as your family members when you get those results back. Great. And maybe I just ask Julie, so what do you say clinically to this person who's now been referred to you in their 20s or 30s with V122i? For them, I mean. And they're asymptomatic. They're asymptomatic. Yeah, this is um, definitely a struggle, and I think something myself and colleagues talk about often, um, but just try to reassure them and also just encourage them to follow back. You know, typically I've been recommending five years. We unfortunately don't have guidelines for this, and so I base this off of some data from HCM patients and their families in terms of screening but um, try to provide them some education. We have a great team of nurse coordinators, so try to provide them that education of signs and symptoms to look for. At the same time, as Sonia alluded to, sometimes that stigma, I think, can really mentally affect patients, so then they think they have a neuropathy when they don't have a neuropathy, or they're worried they have chest pain, and there is no chest pain. Um, so you do want to be cautious and understand your audience, and I think asking them you know, what they understand, what they know, and how they feel, but try to provide reassurance and um, just bring them back to kind of hold their hand in a little, yeah. some respect. Yeah, I would just agree. I mean, this is a disease that we heard as an age-dependent penetrance, so we don't see V122I penetrating usually before the age of 50. Um, the opportunity may be that loved ones who are older in their family may actually have a clinical phenotype, and maybe those are the individuals. Um, so I always encourage um, older adults who have the disease to get their um, not their kids tested, but rather their siblings tested. Question? So I work as a hospitalist, and I see a ton of heart failure patients. You know, and usually cardiologists are involved when there is low ejection fraction, but then they kind of turf off a lot of diastolic heart failures, and you know, a lot of uh, echoes are not actually read by uh, experienced cardiologists if I may, or uh, it's in the substance and not in the conclusion, and a lot of times these are missed. So there are a lot of barriers to diagnosing early, and also our hospitalized patients have that revolving door mechanism where they keep coming, going, coming, going, and a lot of them are 80 plus or 75 plus, and now the cost versus benefit as well as what is the, you know, when you say the biomarkers and you're saying two out of three makes it stage three or stage four, and your life expectancy is 40 months to six months. Here you're dealing with our patients who already have 
um, multiple medical problems, chronic kidney disease, their tropes are elevated, BNP is high to start with. So when you say 40% improvement with treatment, I want to know in years, am I prolonging life or delaying death or am I actually benefiting this patient? What is the number of life uh, in years that you can give with treatment and without treatment so I can approach my patient in a positive way? I think that's an outstanding question and something that each of us are faced with quite routinely. And I think you highlighted that question about the multiple morbidities, right? I think it's if you look at the patient and they can't get out of bed on their own, is this really the patient I want to offer an endomyocardial biopsy to and start thinking about chemotherapy or is the right thing to do to offer palliative care? So I think you have to treat each patient as individual. I don't think we're in necessarily the exact place to judge you know, what is their life worth to them, but looking at the whole picture, are my therapies and the treatments going to ultimately cause harm, or as you said, are they going to cause benefit? But I think that the important thing to know is that this decision does not have to be made on your shoulder. You heard today from a number of colleagues in different subspecialties, amyloidosis can affect many things, so this can be a team decision and approach to how to help you counsel your patient or also just help counsel the patient and their family. But sometimes in my patients who are quite advanced in age, 90 plus, 85 plus, with multiple comorbidities, even if they have TTR amyloidosis, if I feel they have class four heart failure, stage D, and I don't think they're going to be living more than a year, I'm not gonna be offering these patients a stabilizer therapy that's a quarter of a million dollars a year because I'm not sure it's gonna provide that benefit. We saw even from the ATR chart, ATR Act trial, while there is some initial benefit early on from symptoms, it doesn't happen overnight. This takes several months, and you're not seeing mortality benefit for more than a year and a half. So while things might change, um, for now, I think you just need to continue to approach each patient on an individual basis and reach out to your colleagues who can help provide you some guidance. If I can add a little bit to that. So I think that's, that's a great question. And I, as a hematologist, I so see a lot of those patients who have like stage three or stage four NYHA heart failure, and they are diagnosed with light chain amyloidosis. And then are they eligible for treatment? And will the treatment improve the, the quality of life? And will they prolong the, the, the life expectancy? So uh, just to give you an example, I, has, I saw a patient, uh, like she was in her 60s, late 60s, and she was diagnosed with stage four heart failure at another hospital, and then uh, the hospitalist saw the patient, cardiologist saw the patient, they diagnosed her, and then she was sent to hospice. So she was in hospice for at least like two, three months, and then she came to see one of our cardiologists uh, who specializes in uh, amyloidosis, and they started the workup and finally diagnosed her with light chain amyloidosis. So then she came to discuss the, her options with me, and I, I had the discussion with her, yes, the outcomes, the prognosis is not good because you already have stage four heart failure, but we can at least give a trial of the treatment and see if that improves your quality of life. And we started on a single agent uh, tumumab initially to begin with because she was wheelchair bound and she was not even able to walk on her own. And after first couple of months of treatment, her symptoms started to improve. And now she is able to do her activity. She is able to walk at least. She's now six months into the treatment and she's out of the hospice and she's doing really well. So some of these patients can be very sick when we start the treatment and experienced uh, physicians, when we start the, uh, the treatment and we start uh, uh, gently and see how they tolerate. And if they tolerate it, okay, that can help improve their quality of life and also can improve the longevity. I don't know whether it's going to be one year, two years, three years that she's going to live, but at least she will have some quality of life. And the t most of the treatments that we offer these days, especially to, in the uh, hematology world, are not cytotoxic chemotherapies, and most of these treatments are very well tolerated, but we have to start gently and build it up slowly, and we can improve the quality of life in these patients. All right, just to add that, I think you're in a unique position as a hospitalist. Um, there's data from a uh, national health system in the, in the UK in which uh, patients with TTR amyloid um, are hospitalized in the last three years of their life 17 times. So you talk about the revolving door. If you can make this diagnosis, you can institute therapy. We may be able to, as Dr. Rosendahl was mentioning, prevent some readmission. So, um, you know, that's what we're hoping for. Other questions in the back? 
Yeah, um, how different is amyloidosis and amyloid plaque formation in patients with Alzheimer's? So the amyloid type in the brain, the, for the amyloid, uh, amyloid uh, sorry, Alzheimer's patients is a different amyloid type called a beta. Uh, so that's a specific amyloid type. There, there are about maybe 16 different amyloid types seen in the brain, but some of those are very, very rare. So the most common one is a beta, and that's the Alzheimer's uh, amyloid. Is that the question, the answer to the question? Um, yeah, no, uh, sometimes there can be some confusion, particularly with, with family members who may read about, they may have amyloid um, diagnosed by us, say TTR or wild type uh, um, or variant, um, and then they th may, may read about amyloid associated with Alzheimer's, but there really isn't any association, and usually it's just a matter of, of reassurance, but it does get to the point to the point that we've been discussing, which is these older patients do have multiple comorbidities. And so we, we do struggle with this in some of the patients who you know, they may, for example, in neurology, they may come in with a little bit of neuropathy, but they may have a lot of dementia, for example, that's unrelated. So you know, a number of the patients may have other comorbidities which need to be factored into uh, treatment decisions. Is this still on? So there is the I sorry, the idea that, that to pay, there may be amyloidopaths. So people who have amyloid of different types in different parts of their bodies. There is some evidence maybe that there is a link between uh, Alzheimer's and amyloid elsewhere. But it's kind of tenuous and I think there needs to be a lot more research. But that idea is at least floating around out there. I would just add that uh, my clinical experience is the overlap is pretty minimal. I'm surprised. <laughs> you know, like the average age of these patients is 75 or 80, and most of them are quite erudite. And um, the coexistence of the two, at least in my clinical practice, having seen literally 1,000 patients with TTR, is much smaller um, than I would anticipate. The other thing I would also submit is I think the cardiac amyloid world has done a much better job of actually taking care of this disease. You hear what's coming out of FDA approvals for Alzheimer's disease, and it, you know, is associated with um, pretty high costs and not much, you know, necessarily clinical benefit. But the same argument is being held, which is if we can move upstream and identify people earlier in Alzheimer's disease, these therapies might be um, more beneficial in some regards. So I think across all Alzheimer, all amyloid diseases, early diagnosis is really critical. Yeah, a great uh, conversation, great talks. Oh my God, I'm learning so much already from each of you. It's fantastic. So, uh, in my reading, uh, therapy, Julie or Matt or anyone, uh, I think you probably did mention. Maybe I forgot, I missed it. Uh, doxycycline plus uh, taro or so deoxycholic acid. What is the data? That's one. Secondly. From a patient perspective, and on you know, regular every day, uh, after you've seen your patients with heart disease, heart failure, whatever, their question is, "What should I eat? What should I take? Uh, you know, and you know how much exercise?" Those are the most common questions, almost on a daily basis, with every patient, and then some. What is that some question? What about green tea, Doctor Rosenthal? What about turmeric? Will it prevent? Alzheimer's, will it prevent amyloidosis? Is there any data or is there a therapeutic strategy that maybe, we, you know, there is some evidence there? What are your thoughts on that? One question, I think prior to 2018, most of us in the room who are practicing amyloid physicians, these are the tools that we could reach for in addition to palliative care. <laughs> um, we were reaching for these things like Tudka and doxycycline and green tea. I found doxycycline in the state of Arizona quite challenging due to photosensitivity, seeing lots of sunburns in our patients or GI intolerance. Um, that being said, I think the data is quite minimal and um, there's some data in some animal models, but we haven't seen on a large scale 
in human models, overall morbidity and mortality benefit, and due to potential side effects and drug interactions, I'm no longer using these in my practice. The clinical trials did exclude um, patients from taking specifically the green tea. I do not know about turmeric, but um, maybe Matt can comment on that in ATTRC, but I know doxy and green tea were excluded from some of the clinical trials. So those are not agents I'm using. There was actually some data recently published for our AL amyloid patients. I think people are now steering away from doxycycline, even in AL amyloid, which used to be standard of care in that first year we're giving doxy with the Cyborg-D. Um, so I think the community is going more away from those um, more herbal or other types of agents for treatment of amyloid. To answer your second question in terms of what do we educate our patients regarding diet, I think that's a whole one hour lecture in terms of the supportive care from a heart failure standpoint, right, for individuals with amyloid. We talked this morning, or I talked this morning about disease targeted therapy, but what about how we treat our patients just from a neuropathy standpoint or heart failure standpoint? Those are whole lectures in themselves. From a dietary standpoint, most of these patients I find are quite um, cachectic, malnourished due to malabsorption or just poor cardiac output and difficulty absorbing, so they get that early satiety feeling. So I typically put my patients on a seafood diet. I've coined this term from Eric Steadley. Not that they need to eat seafood, but meaning they, they see food, they eat food. You know, there's a lot of controversy for those that you attended the ACC Arizona. I was a part of a debate with a colleague from Tucson, you know, salt restriction versus no salt restriction. I do not salt restrict in my practice. I think there is great data out there for salt restriction in the hypertensive heart disease world. I think um, Dr. Maher recently had a paper out in Jack with some additional colleagues, you know, on what is the optimal diet. And I think trying to tailor to your patient is probably the most important thing. And for these patients, quality of life should be at the top of our list. They're suffering in so many ways. So for me and for many people, food can bring pleasure. So I let them eat whatever they want to eat. It just might mean some extra torsamide or Lasix or Bumex not to provide um, to any one department. So just let them enjoy it. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Maurer, um, uh, Ellen, uh, I wanted to ask one question before we break for lunch. Um, so if we have a 30% likelihood of uh, detecting the monoclonal protein um, with fat or bone marrow in TTR, but we have a 70 or higher percent in AL, should we be preferentially considering cardiac biopsy in patients with suspected ATTR? And the reason I'm asking this question is, it takes time in some institutions to organize a bone marrow biopsy and a fat ped biopsy. And by the time you get all that back and it's negative, you have a 70% chance. Now you're going into potentially cardiac biopsy or you could just preemptively treat them for ATTR. So I'm just sort of wondering, I feel confused as a practitioner, um, what type of biopsies we should be ordering when? That's a great question. And in fact, I had put this conversation with one of our our uh, cardiac amyloid guys at Mayo Rochester a couple days ago. But I think when there's an M protein, you don't know which one it's going to be at that point. It could be either one. So um, that's why we next go to the fat and the bone marrow at that point. I suppose if you're really strongly pushing for treat as fast as possible, the ideal site is the heart. So I don't think it's ever wrong to go to the heart first, but um, because at the point with the M protein, you really don't know which way it's going to go. If it's AL, then you have an 80% chance of making the diagnosis with something a lot simpler, like a fat or a bone marrow. So it's an excellent question. I don't think it's ever wrong to go to the site of interest first. Is it okay to treat without having the protein? Because if you have a negative biopsy, then you're empirically treating for uh, ATTR. Is it okay to stop you know, there and say, well, we didn't find it in the bone or fat? I'm not sure of the clinical circumstance <laughs> you're describing, but I would be very cautious about trying to institute treatment without being sure what the precursor protein is. I mean, look, these are two um, very different diseases if you see enough patients. AL is a medical emergency. So if you get light chains back and they're abnormal, uh, these patients usually look very sick, and this is something in which you need to move quickly. I mean, in the days when we started to try to do transplants on patients with AL amyloid, the median time to death was 56 days. Now, these are really advanced AL patients, as we saw in the curves. So, you know, you measure light chains, and it's abnormal. You need to have a clock in your head, as Martha Grogan would say, and you need to get that person in and move as quickly as you can, whether it's a fat pad first, and if it's negative, then a heart biopsy. 
Um, you know, TTR is a very indolent disease. Um, the other thing, just epidemiologically, is that you know, TTR is the tail that's going to wag the dog, right? It is going to be, as we heard, I bet 95% of all cardiac amyloid we see in the future, just given the epidemiology of who's getting you know, amyloid and aging. So um, uh, if you do this enough, uh, you get a real good flavor for what people have. But I would just say, you know, if you think they have AL, call all your friends, call them quickly, <laughs> your hematologist, get consults, and do not dawdle, right? I would just echo the following. I think if we walk away from anything Dr. Hussain um, highlighted in this morning's talk is AL amyloid is a heme emergency. So from a cardiologist perspective, I hope that each of you think of this as a STEMI. Time is light chain, just like time is myocardium. And I would never want to treat these patients blindly. You heard from Dr. McPhail this morning, 25 to 40% of individuals with TTR amyloid are going to have some kind of MGUS. And just because they have an MGUS, they might have AL amyloid, they can have Walden they can have TTR. So I had a patient who I for sure thought had AL amyloid. Fat pad was negative. He went for a bone marrow and turns out he had Wallenstrom's, but didn't fit his cardiac picture. So ultimately he got a cardiac biopsy and turns out he has TTR amyloid. So his Wallenstrom's is now remission and he's on to famitis. Interestingly, his ejection fraction remodeled went from 20% to 65. So I'm thinking this was some light chain circulating toxicity. I don't know, but I think that we have potential to cause more harm than good if we're treating an MGUS blindly. I think many of us on this stage in this audience have seen individuals being treated with chemotherapy for TTR amyloid because they had that background of MGUS. So really, um, it, thanks to our colleague, Dr. Dahlgren and colleagues at Mayo in 2009, we developed this technology you heard about this morning with mass spec. So I think tissue is an issue. And to stress to each of you in the room, you know, where do I go? You go wherever you can get the fastest result. Like who can help you the quickest? As Dr. Maurer said, you call all your friends. Fat pad yield is somewhat low for TTR amyloid, but it doesn't mean they don't have TTR. And the biopsy of the bone marrow too might not show TTR or AL amyloid. So you ultimately do have to go to the organ that is problematic. And I think in this day and age, uh, cardiac bio biopsy is relatively safe. There is about a one to 5% risk of perforation, but in experienced hands, this can be done and, and should be done. All right. That's wonderful. I think we should break for lunch. We'll be back at 1245 for our keynote address.